Hey, Edith. Hey, Christy. How do you fix a broken tomato? I don't know. With tomato paste. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't guess that. Okay. Yeah, yeah I thought you would. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners in Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening is becoming very popular. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips, a fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Well, hi, everybody. Hello, gardeners everywhere, and hello, Edith, sitting hello. over there. And hello, Christy, sitting right over there. This week, we're talking about tomatoes. Mm-hmm. It's that time of year. Yep. You should have them in the ground, depending on... Most everybody should at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. depending on where you live. And so we'll talk more about what we're doing for tomatoes 2022. But first, we need to kind of celebrate that looks like everything survived the snow we got a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Everything, you know, everything in my garden survived the snow, but something is out there, Christy, um, making things vanish. Yeah, me too. You too? I have, I've lost two peppers. I went out there this morning and saw that I lost a pepper. I mean, there's not a clue of it. There's Was nothing. there a little stem too? Like a little bit, like my pepper was like fallen over, like, like, like somebody had gnawed it. No, that happened to one of my tomatoes and oh. that happened to one of my broccoli, but no, it was just vanished. Well, you know what I'm wondering if this is what it is, Edith? What? Is that when I uncovered the whole garden, because it was covered for a good three days, don't you think, as yeah. the snow melted? Yeah. I uncovered something and I noticed that there were roly polies everywhere. Christy, I was thinking the same exact thing. Do you remember? I don't even remember when, but we had a letter from Laura from New Albu Mexico. From New yes. Mexico saying that roly-polies were a real problem down there. And we kind of laughed at it. Yeah, I said, I love roly-polies. I don't <laughs> love them. And now I'm starting to squish them. Oh, no. Yeah. So I wonder if it's roly-polies. When it's, I mean, but how can the whole entire plant just vanish? Yeah, unless it's a rabbit, Edith, too. Because, you know, I have a rabbit in my yard. Mm -hmm. My rabbit, my rabbit, Cindy. Though I yeah. haven't seen her in a while. Maybe she moved over to your house. Because friends, I know, you know I have a rabbit Edith lives there. just a couple of blocks yeah. away from me, so... Yeah. So maybe that's what it is. So I don't know, but luckily I planted really a lot of extra this year. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, because I needed it, I guess. The only thing that I didn't really survive the snow, which is very weird, Edith, yeah. is the spinach. You mean it died? Your little spinach died? It's still kind of out there, but it got like a, it got frost on it. You know what I mean? It got frostbit. Oh. I covered it up with a cloth, and I don't know if it just got mushed or something like that, but you know, a lot hmm. of the leaves just kind of turned mushy and brown. Oh, but everything else looks great. Well, good, good. Things are, things on the whole look pretty good in mine too, you know? Um, I, th I think my radishes were a failure. I mean, I right now I seem to have more failures to talk about. Oh, ra you're really? Radishes? How? I know, the easiest thing in the world. That is weird, you know, because I, um, I planted mine maybe about three weeks ago and I could even harvest some today. Mm, yeah, that's about, wow. That, that's great. They're like a twenty-eight days, so that's like a, a yeah. week early. That's they're wonderful. little. They're they're little, but they're uh -huh. they look good. Yeah. Well, I don't know what happened to mine. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Honestly, I don't. It's so weird how gardening can just be amazing. You know, it's so dependent mm -hmm. upon all the, these conditions, and then some of it is just a mystery. It's yeah. like the theater, Edith. Mm. Huh? Mm. You know, when you work so hard and the play looks like a total mess. Yeah. And then it opens and it's wonderful. Yeah. It's, I'm misquoting Tom Stoppard here in Shakespeare in Love. But, you know, and then it's wonderful. And then we just, it's a mystery sometimes. Yeah. You don't know how. Yeah. Well, I have a present for you. You do. Because I just was out into my garden today, yeah. just doing a little walk, just before you walked over, and look what I have. I'm looking. Oh, my God. Look at those strawberries. They're beautiful. These are the first strawberries of the year. Oh, man. I have some Facebook friends that have been showing pictures of their strawberries. I've been so jealous. Oh, my God. This is so beautiful. I have one for you. I have one for our um, enigmatic mm. and exceptional engineer. And one for me. I'm going to eat one right now. They're real good, Christy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. They're so good. Yeah, so that's kind of exciting. And my roses are in bloom. I I'm noticed two, two roses this morning myself. Mm -hmm. So I love June so much. It's early June. But you know, it's not, it hasn't been in the 90s yet. 
It's been comfortably in the 70s. It's mm-hmm. just been really great. What else is going on in your garden as we're enjoying our strawberries? Honestly, just not a whole lot. Um, just, you know, things are just growing apace, growing mm-hmm. or mysteriously vanishing. I can't even really <laughs> tell. So why don't you tell me if you have more to tell about your garden? And okay. then I want to say this thing, this really interesting thing that I read. Okay, well, here's what else is going on, um, is that I have been giving away a lot of plants, Edith, on mm-hmm. Facebook forums, and just saying, does anybody want this? And I'll just, I just say, for free or trade. And and I don't mind free at all, but the trade has been very interesting on the things that I've gotten. I remember you got a ground cherry. That was last, last year. year. Mm-hmm. This year, somebody gave me a jar of honey from their bees. Nice. Isn't that amazing? Somebody gave me some borage. B O R A G E. Oh, we talked herb. about borage. In the Middle Ages, they thought it gave you courage. Knights wore it yes. into battle. So now I have some. Be careful, it's lethal to dogs and cats, supposedly. Okay. Is it like rhubarb, though? Because they always say rhubarb is poisonous, but you have to eat like a cart full and of it's rhubarb. It's just the leaves. leaves of rhubarb. Yeah. Right. Just they the never leaves. really say that, but when you figure a little tiny kitty or dog, they weigh so much less than Oh, them, so good I point. Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, I got some board, which was nice. Somebody said, Oh, I have some dill, dill to give you. And I went, Oh, I'll take some dill because I hadn't even started any yet. And I got it. And, and she left, and I realized that's not dill, that's fennel. Oh. But I did. I planted it. <laughs> okay. You know how we are with fennel. We plant it. It becomes this beautiful thing. And yeah. then we never get the bulb, though. Yeah. It never. But yeah. I threw it in the ground um, just to see, you know, what that's going to be like. Somebody gave me, in exchange, I gave her some apple mint and she gave me um, eggs from her chickens. Nice. And Edith, she gave me three turkey eggs. Oh, my. Have you ever had those before? No. They're. We had them in an omelet this morning. They're they big, were, huh? They were big, but they were great. Yeah. Three three um, turkey eggs, I think, kind of is the equivalency probably of six eggs. It wow. Was, they were big. They were delicious. Very cool. That's very cool. And then I also had somebody who, I love this, she traded me some jade starts, Edith, mm-hmm. jade plant starts, and she told me that this was a from a 40-year-old jade plant wow that her mother had which you know i always like it when yeah. we have these connections to our families and yeah. i want to show you i planted these jade starts you really like the uh the history oh yeah. look at that and nice. you can see here that they have these little babies so it has these jade starts have take and look how huge these leaves are when she says baby she means out the top are coming little tiny leaves yeah so mm-hmm. it means like my transplant worked and I mean, this is this. These leaves are so thick on this plant. Pretty, so really pretty. Kind, I'm very. But I'm gonna. But it, in the same color pot as the jade that you gave me, so that they can kind of be jade buddies. Good. Every jade needs a buddy. That's right. Um, I also just wanted to show a failure, which is that you know I had ficus trees that yes. I had replanted, and they were so successful. I tra- I transplanted them in just little plastic cups that were yeah. clear with holes, and then I just put them in a pot, and they're just beautiful. And I think those, uh, when you come upstairs, I'll show you two, I think they're like, they may be like, I don't know, it's like a foot just high like now. Foot. Mm-hmm. They look really good and healthy. Yeah. So then I tried to do it again. Here's what this one looks like. Oh, my goodness. Did not work. Total fail. Same so, soil? Same, same soil. I did the exact same holes thing. Holes in the bottom yes. of the... And I used a little rooting hormone, and I watered it and put it in the same window. Wow. Didn't take, so mystery. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about our celery, Edith. Remember that? Yes. We were celebrating National Celery Month, March, mm-hmm. um, and I started some winter sown. And did you get any? Because I never got any. You didn't. You thought you did, right? I thought I did, then I realized it was moss or something. <laughs> and I didn't think I had anything at all, and lo and behold, mine started growing and I was really super excited about it yeah but here's the thing folks if you are winter sowing and I know that why do you call it winter sowing when it is June I guess you can call it spring sowing in milk jugs and plastic containers Um, make sure you go out there and you keep an eye on the watering Mm. because did you come showing you I had I had maybe like 12 or so little plants started and it fried there's one can you see that one little celery Oh, man. I don't think any. I'm gonna, I'll stick it in the ground when it gets a little bigger, but keep your eye yeah. on it, it. And if you don't know what winter sowing is, folks, we'll put a link in it. But it's just an outdoor method of seed starting in plastic containers outside. 
and it, um, we do it a lot. I have, I have, I can't stop planting, Edith. Are you still planting? I'm doing annuals now. Okay. <laughs> in milk jugs. So I have like about 20 out of my back patio still. I, I planted zinnias, marigolds, and calendula. And I know that you can just direct sow these mm -hmm. right now in mm -hmm. most places. But this way I know that they will come up where I want them to be. Right. So I have a little bit more. And, I don't, and I'm not sure about the quality of my seed. My seed is old. So I'm not really quite sure how well things are going to germinate. Mm. So I'm kind of, I'm doing, I'm doing it, doing a lot good. for that too. Mm -hmm. So having extra is always good. Um, and I just, I was going to ask you, do you want um, some zucchini starters? Because I started zucchini. Oh, in, no, um, I have one and he is really, he's a wonderful size. He's like eight inches across. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. he's just doing great. Okay. Mine just started to get its. It's second and third true leaves. Is he in the ground or is he, he still in the ground now? In the ground. But I have like four or five extra. Yeah. So I, no, nobody needs more than one zucchini. I generally. know. That's why I want them if you yeah. want one. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> no, thanks. I've also yeah. I've asked around too. I've also asked um, what else? Oh, do you want some pumpkin starters? So oh, you're shaking. I don't your have head. room for no. I don't have room okay. for pumpkin. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, because I took. I took seeds from my pumpkin from last year that was in the compost pile. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm just going to throw it in a milk jug and see what happens. And I threw nine seeds in there. You have nine starts? I have nine starts of pumpkin. So. No, no, thank you. But maybe you can trade out. Maybe you can do another posting and trade some of these things out. Oh, that's a, that is a very, very good point. Um, what's blooming in your yard right now, Edith? Well, I've got a lot of lettuce. You know, we talked about last year, we talked about, um, down the butcher, uh, wheat rich poultry down the street. Uh -huh. Um, so I took a bunch to them and put it in, they have a take if you're, you know, a refrigerator, a, a refrigerator for free food. Yes. So I took a bunch down there. That is such a great idea. And, um, you know, and I wrote on it, it says people, if, if it's some people, if it's not packaged from a store are suspicious of it. So I just wrote on it, organic, homegrown. Uh huh. We'll see if anybody took it. Yeah. But rather than go to waste, you know. I think that's a fact because you tried to give me some of your lettuce. I had I made some for <laughs> you today it. and uh, forgot to bring it over. I'm good on lettuce. In fact, my romaine is. I think I'm ready to start harvesting my romaine. It looks just stunningly beautiful. Good. And it eat it. It's a sort of this bright lime green color. Mm -hmm. This romaine lettuce, and the, oh, that's a botanical interest seed that I got. It is. It's so beautiful. I'm a, I don't even want to harvest it because it looks so pretty out there. Yeah. Well, we'll leave some out there for to make seeds for next year. Hey, that's a, hey, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, you have a musing, Edith, right? I do, and and it's it pertains to tomatoes. So, do you ever do you hear of that store uh, of that show, Naked and Afraid? Yes. Have you ever watched it? I I have, and I and. Um, I did it fully clothed and <laughs> and fully in control of my well, I have emotions. Never, I've never watched it. I I don't want to see naked, afraid people. I mean, I don't even want to <laughs> see afraid people. I don't want to see naked people. So this is like everything it's I don't... It's all too much. It's, it's I, everything I don't want to <laughs> see, naked and afraid. No, thank you. But anyway, this guy who's a contestant, he's a survivalist. The night before he was sent to a rainforest in Peru, which is where they are now, he ate a bunch of tomatoes, and then when he got there, he pooped in the in the rainforest. Uh -huh. He mixed it with some soil, and he's growing his own tomatoes. Sure. Hey, that's just like the Martian. It's with exactly Matt Damon. like that, except Matt Damon didn't have any soil, so I was a little suspicious. But well, he had Martian soil. We had Martian soil. Yeah, but isn't that cool? <laughs> you know, it's it's handy to know. It, it is very handy to you know. You never know yeah. when you're yeah. going to need to plant something, you know, or a make a gardening, make a, um, what is it called? Like a, a thong out of tomatoes because you're tired of being naked. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, Edith, tomatoes, the leaves make me itchy. So if I made like a little, a little clothing outfit out of tomatoes, uh -huh. I'd just be itching myself everywhere. So I'd be, I would, I would not be naked and afraid, but I would be itchy and afraid. <laughs> itchy and afraid. I don't know which is worse, Christy. I'll, I think I'd go naked. I think I would too. <laughs> well, folks, if you don't understand some of the terms we're talking about, you can just go to our website and go to the humorous and always informative Upside Down Dictionary at UpsideDownTulips.com.
We also, we have fun stuff on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Yes. And we have a um, awesome pod play coming up for everyone right now, Edith. This is number eight in the installment of everybody's favorite, The Old Woman Who Used to Live in a Shoe, starring the queen of Denver's theater, Billy McBride. Here we go. Hi, friends. Old woman who lived in a shoe here. So I quit smoking a while back. Everyone said that the craving would go away. Well, everybody was wrong. It's been months, and I still want a cigarette so bad I'd wrestle a warthog for a half-smoked butt. I got this rubber band on my wrist. They say pull it and make it snap so it hurts. How is this supposed to work? Now I'm jonesing for a cig and my hand hurts, which makes me want to smoke. So in order to take my mind off of my craving, my friend Old Mother Hubbard gave me a book of inspirational quotations, which I will now read as I sit in my garden under my pawpaw tree. Oh, this is nice. Smells good out here. Bees, birds, butterflies. It's perfect. Okay. Breathe. Ready to be inspired by great thoughts. So here we go. Quote, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Huh? Is there anyone on the planet that isn't aware of this? How is this inspirational or even interesting? How about today is the last day of the rest of your life? Now that'll get my attention. I'm just saying. Next quote. Nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. What? Oh, I see. If you stick an apostrophe in impossible, it becomes I'm possible. That's just bone stupid. Box of rocks dumb. That, that just pisses me off. Like somehow punctuation has profound insights into the human experience. You're going into my compost. Okay, what's next? Quote, It's not the number of breaths we take, but the number of moments that take our breath away. Ha <laughs> ha, I think in the end it is the number of breaths we take and what we do with them. I had food poisoning once, and that took my breath away, among other things. Don't need any more of those moments. But I'm just an old woman who used to live in a shoe. God, I want to smoke. But I'll keep reading, because this book was a gift. Next. Quote, it is what it is. I just can't. No. Next. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Okay, that's it. I can't take any more. Haven't any of these people taken a science class? Land among the stars? On what? The surface of a star can be measured by this. It's 40,000 kelvins which is 71,540.33 degrees. What a bunch of bulls... Birds, bees, and butterflies. <sighs> okay, I'm better now. Quote, Trees are poems the earth writes upon the sky. We fell them down and turned them into paper that we may record our emptiness. Khalil Gibran. You know what? I don't know who that is, this Khalil Gibran person, but the more I thought about what he said, as I sat under my pawpaw tree, the more I was struck speechless. I, I couldn't even move. My martini fell out of my hands and spilled onto the ground. 
I suddenly didn't care about smoking anymore. I just kept thinking about that quote. We fell them down and turned them in the paper that we may record our emptiness. I looked up, and there, in the pawpaw tree that I planted, I could see it was a shelter for birds and gave them food to eat. It was a home for all kinds of bugs. It was food for squirrels. It gave me shade, and it gave me pawpaws. I planted that tree, but it turns out it isn't just for me. It's for so many creatures. And as I sat there, I felt filled up with a kind of good feeling, like the opposite of emptiness. And I thought, this is better than slapping my wrist with a rubber band. Of course, most things are. But this was special. This took me through another day in which I did not have a cigarette and did not crave it either. And I will never, ever cut down this pawpaw tree or any other tree either. Well, I'd stay here all day under this tree, except that I spilled my martini and I had drunk hardly any of it. So I'm going to go in the house and make me another martini. I am so full of gratitude. Did I just say that? Oh my God, who am I? I better make it a double. If there's one thing to plant in your garden this year, Edith, mm -hmm. don't you think it should be a tomato? Um, yes, um, unless you're one of those weirdos that don't like tomatoes. Oh. People don't like them, you know, because of the um, texture. Oh, interesting. Isn't that something? I just know a handful of people. That I feel sorry really... for them. Well, I feel bad because to me, that's the joy of the summer is to go out and yeah. pick a tomato, to put it on a BLT, to just pop a cherry tomato in your mouth, to make sauce. To... Or even just to smell those leaves. That yeah. incredible, wonderful smell. Like minty, right? Like yeah. a sharp mint. Oh, my gosh. And they're really, you know, not that difficult to grow. And they're the most popular vegetable, mm -hmm. even though tomato is a fruit. But it's the most popular yeah. plant to grow in, in one's vegetable garden. Across yeah. the world, I think. They're, they're I so think so, popular. too. In a garden, in a container. Um, they're really not that hard to grow. And we have a few tips that will help you along the way. And we've talked about tomatoes before, friends. And if you want to know, like, tomatoes from the ground up, you should go listen to our episode six, way back episode six, Edith. We're on wow. 85 now, Wow. which is called Tomatoes, How to Plant Plump Things with a Navel. Yeah, yeah. And um, also check out episode 52, which is What's the Matter with My Tomatoes? Mm -hmm. BLT Help is here. <laughs> yeah. And of course, right now, there's nothing wrong with, toma with my tomatoes because they all just look happy. It's yeah. usually around it's around end of July and August that I start seeing. I had I had somebody something cut off one of my tomatoes at the soil line. It could have been a, a roly poly or a cutworm. Uh -huh. So what I did is I made I took a toilet roll. Oh yes, yeah, and I slid it, and then the next time I planted a tomato, I stuck that in the soil around it, hoping to make a collar that will work. Right, because this is because sometimes these worms. Or bugs mm -hmm. are kind of stupid. Yeah, they hit a toilet roll and go, ew, no. <laughs> go back. And as we said before, we just have to be one step smarter than a bug or a worm. Yeah, yeah. That's not so bad. Hey, you know, this is, we're talking about tomatoes 2022. So this is about what's new in the tomato world mm -hmm. and what we're planting in our gardens this year for folks who want to know. And uh, I learned some interesting facts, Edith, about new elements about tomatoes in the news. Okay, what are they? Well, one, and this is from, uh, from CNN, said that scientists have come up with a potential new and vegan source of vitamin D, which is the tomato gene has been edited with that CRISPR-KS9 technology, and they can now put vitamin D into tomatoes. I heard that they did that using a fish gene, a gene from a fish. Is that this is this is the same thing? I, I I do not know, Edith. I'm not entirely sure. Because that sure. makes it genetically modified. Yes, right. And you know the main source of vitamin D that people eat mm -hmm. is out of fish and dairy mm -hmm. products, mm -hmm. and so that can be a struggle for those who are on a plant based diet. Um, they consider that 
uh, if they increase the vitamin D in tomatoes, that will help a billion people globally. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. What else? I also read in the news, this is from New Scientist, that um, the chemical that makes tomatoes red, mm -hmm. which is called, um, it's a um, lycopene, lycopene uh -huh. um, is being used in a new kind of solar panel. So uh, previously solar panels have been made out of silicone, but they're making a new kind from a thin film called per perovskite. Yeah. And the problem with this new kind, though, is that it has a tendency to degrade far more quickly than the silicone cells. So they're adding liposine, which is the red-colored pigment from found in tomatoes and other red-colored fruits and vegetables, um, to the solar panel cells because it's an antioxidant. And it will inhibit the oxidization of other compounds. Oh, wow. So tomatoes are helping make solar panels. Wow. Well, I read something too, Christy, in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry from April 17th. Listen to us go with the research. <laughs> nice sourcing, Edith. <laughs> Thank you. I've learned how to source. Uh, you know how we were always taught that when you cook something, it degrades the nutritional value? Uh-huh. This is not so with cooking tomatoes. Like when you make spaghetti sauce and so on, uh -huh. it actually enhances the nutritional value. It increases the lycopene content, which we were just talking about. Uh -huh. It increases it. And for example, tomato samples, I'm going to read from the experiment, were heated to 88 degrees Celsius, which is 190.4, which is right under boiling. Okay. 212 is boiling. For two minutes, a quarter hour and a half hour. And although the vitamin C decreased a little bit, mm -hmm. the beneficial trans lycopene content increased by 54%, 171%, 164%. I'm going to make spaghetti sauce for dinner tonight. I'm telling you what. So it looks like cooking this stuff actually boosts the nutrition, which I had no idea. I, it, it's also true in broccoli, isn't it? I don't know about broccoli. I haven't yeah, done I my broccoli true. research. I was not sent home with broccoli <laughs> research to do. Well, then don't worry about oh that. Oh, my God, the pressure. I can't handle it. <laughs> what else you got on the news for tomatoes? The dietary way? fiber. Also, the tomatoes are just incredibly good for you. Raw or even or cooked even better, apparently, which I had no idea. Um, like you mentioned, the antioxidants also work to fight off cancer. They work to make your skin better, everything. Wonderful. So that's just good news just when for you can't all of love us. A, just when you can't love them more, huh? Absolutely. Just when you can't love a tomato more, you find all this wonderful stuff out. Good. And my, my final little thing, Christy, what is the rarest tomato, do you think? I don't know. It is called the green zebra tomato plant. I actually grew one once because our neighbor Mel gave me one. And it's green, and it does. It looks exactly like a wow. green zebra, not in the shape of a zebra. Uh -huh. It's round. But it's kind of stripy, you mean. It's stripy. It's an heirloom. And what was interesting to me is that this tomato was chosen by Alice Waters for her restaurant in Berkeley, Chez Panisse. She puts out, have you ever had one of her uh, cookbooks? No. Oh, she's like famous. Okay. Oh, yeah. And she uses this in her cooking. Oh, wow. I just thought that was interesting. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, if it's right now, it's June. It's June. And now some people may have grown tomatoes by seed, but Edith and I, folks, why don't you do some from seed? But mostly we. I do. All, I have done all, seed all of them year? except for one. I bought one okay. bigger one because I wanted or something earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So most of yours is from seed. Yeah. All of my tomatoes came from a garden center today. Is that right? So here are some tips, friends. If you are like me and you're going out to buy a tomato plant at a garden center, uh, first of all, Edith and I, of course, we both recommend that you go to a reputable garden center and please go to your local nursery. Our local nursery, being Southwest Gardens, has, right down the street. I've been going them for to, to them for decades, and they're just great. Um, the difference between that and a big box store, if you're going to go to one of those stores, is that they don't have people who are trained and dedicated to take care of those plants, and mm -hmm. they probably didn't grow those plants. They probably got them shipped in from somebody else. When you're at your local nursery, please look for healthy green plants 
and look for like four to six leaves on the plant mm-hmm. and for sturdy, straight stems. And don't, you don't have it be leggy. Don't have it be so yeah. tall with less leaves. Good that, point. That's not the way to go. And check out that stem because the, you should, the stem shouldn't have any brown streaks or general brown tint to the color of the stem. That stem should be green, green, green. Also, check the leaves for signs of insects or disease such as brown spots, holes, or curling. And avoid any plants that appear wilted yellow or have spindly thin stems. Mm-hmm. Good. Very good. We recommend that you select a young plant. Um, now, we don't mean the tiniest little plant that you can find, but try to find plants that are about four to eight inches tall. And make sure they're about as wide as they are tall, too. Like Edith was saying, not don't get a, stin, a spindly plant. And I did the same test. Remember last year, Edith, I bought three plants that mm-hmm. were more expensive, that were maybe, you know, maybe a foot high. Right. And they were maybe $10 a plant. I remember. Mm-hmm. And then I bought three plants that were $3 a piece, mm-hmm. and maybe they were like five inches tall. Yeah. And after they grew a while, right, Yep. I could not tell the difference. That, that'll happen. That's great. And I had did it as the same thing again. Yeah. And I had my handsome and handy husband come out into the vegetable garden. This was after the snow, so we had taken all the containers off. And I said, I want you to tell me which ones do you think were the $10 plants and which were the $3 plants. And he could not tell. And you know what's interesting about that is they have not been in the ground all that long. No. Because here in Colorado, you usually don't even put a tomato plant in until after Mother's Day. Right, because and this, you want the temperature, Yeah, uh, the nighttime temperature should be in the upper 40s to low 50s. So a lot of people do wait until June 1st. Wow. See, that's amazing. So they they do catch up. Once they, they get in that up. ground, so they save feel yourself the, some money. Save yourself they some money. They figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the last thing I would recommend if you're buying plants in a garden center is check the soil in the container. Make sure it isn't dried out. Like stick your finger in there to check for moisture. Um, try to avoid tomato plants when the soil appears to be dried out because that's a sign they haven't been properly watered. Which honestly, Christy, I've seen that I see that so much at the big box stores. Mm-hmm. And that also means that they are weakened. They have weakened that tomato plant mm-hmm. and it won't do as well, grow as fast. It might not even make it. Wow. Even if it's still alive, because mm-hmm. it was deprived of water. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about how to harden off your tomato plants. And then we're going to go through all the tomato varieties that we're growing in our garden right now. But first, we're bringing back a repeat of one of our favorite pod plays because it seems appropriate. This is called Boxing Tomatoes. This is the one with John Ashton. Right. And written by? By myself. By by yourself. (laughs) My very own self. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy. Here we are ringside in Madison Square Garden, New York, New York, for the boxing event of the decade. The match between two tomatoes to determine who is the world heavyweight tomato champ. In this corner of the ring, we have the current world champ, weighing in at 8.39 pounds, the big Zack Tomato. He has fought and beaten the big boy, the better boy, and the beefsteak. Is bigger better, Betty? By God, Bobby, you better believe it. Big Zach's challenger in the other corner is a Titan tomato grown from the seed of the Guinness World Record holder for the heaviest tomato ever, grown by Dan McCoy of Ely, Minnesota, and weighing in at 8.2 pounds, it's Titan the third. And they're off. They're rolling around in the ring, and Titan connects with a combination of a jab, right cross, and left hook to the stem. Oh, that's gotta hurt. Now Big Zack comes back with a jab across, a left uppercut, and a punch to the navel. But that's below the belt. No, Bobby, there are no belts on boxing tomatoes. Oh, look at Titan. He's as badly shaken as a bottle of clotted ketchup. Now Titan has Big Zack in the corner, and this is getting ugly. There's tomato juice and seeds flying everywhere. And before we have nothing but tomato soup up there, the ref has called it a draw. Thoughts, Bobby? Well, Betty, I'm a gardener, and I know that good things can come in small packages. So you don't have to grow the biggest just as long as you grow something. You're a winner in the ring of life. 
Hola, we're back. Edith, did you harden off your tomato plants that you grew inside and before oh, you brought them Oh, always, inside? always, yeah. And what's your process? Um, I put them on the porch during the day in the sun, and I bring them in the house at night. I have a designated area. As you know, I'm not a great housekeeper, so <laughs> it doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> and, and, and how long was the process? Um, well, it takes a while, Christy, because you're supposed to start them Four to six weeks before planting them. Mm. So I start, When you started your seeds. When I start my seeds. And mm-hmm. I usually start them too early because I get excited. Yeah. Um, but this year I was really busy. We both were. So I started them, I think, late March. And and how long did it... How long before you, were, you planted them in the ground? So you were taking them outside on your uh-huh. porch or putting them inside, outside, inside? Probably five weeks. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, this is when they were seeds too, right? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah, sun helps them you. come up, you know, so, so, I mean, it's a bit, you know, I put them all on a big tray and I mm-hmm. just carry the tray in and out every day. And hardening up is equally important when you buy a tomato plant from the garden center. Even more because it's in a greenhouse, which is always warmer than what I keep mm-hmm. my house at. And hardening up, I guess we'd just say like, it's just like getting the plants used to yes. uh, being a little chilly at night and being warmer during the day. Yeah. Which is kind of true. Like that happens to, I think to people too, because, um, Eventually, we get used to the 90, 90 degree temperature. Right. And the same thing is true, you know, like growing up in Minnesota, I could handle, you know, temperatures below zero, no problem. But now you put me out there and I'm yeah. like, I've lost all my hardening off. Well, look like Fr- Floridians. I have a sister from uh-huh. Florida. When she comes here, she freezes to death. And I'm like, Dagmar, it's 70. Oh, gee. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? She's wearing a turtleneck and gloves. Yeah, I'm and- so cold. <laughs> Drinking hot cocoa. Well, um, uh, when you do bring it, get a plant from the garden center, uh-huh. you should start slowly. Um, on the first day, set them outside in the shade next to the house in a protected area for an hour or two, then bring them inside. And then just keep raising the exposure. Mm-hmm. Gradually increase the time your plants are outside each day and monitor them and check to see how they're doing. And then finally, you can leave them out overnight. Make sure the forecast of the temperature is above 50 degrees during the nighttime. And if it gets really warm, don't forget, there's not a lot of soil in there. Mm. In a seed pot, they, they dry out really quickly. That's even, a good point. even if they haven't broken the soil yet, mm-hmm. do not let them dry out completely. That's a great or point. Or you'll lose them. Well, I'm just saying that's what you're supposed to do, Edith. Yes. But what did I do this year? Did you lose them? What you do? <laughs> no, I just, I don't know what happened to me, but I bought my plants and I set them outside. They were kind of in a shady area. And um, I just continued to leave them outside. I kind of <laughs> forgot to bring them in. And it just kind of, so I don't know if that's going to hurt their. But they didn't die. They didn't die. All and right. then eventually, and I probably did that for maybe like three, four days. I went, oh, for crying out loud. I just. Oh, okay. I thought you meant like for weeks. No. but oh, like, okay. Yeah. I did it. For, maybe it might have been a good week before. It might have been a week. And then I just went, you know what? Wow. They're going on the ground. Wow, good. And then, of course, it snowed, so then I had to cover them. But they're looking great right now. Good. So good, let's good. share with everybody what we're growing this year. And right. I bet the first thing, some of the, we're growing some that are similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, if I would say there's anybody out there, Edith, yeah. who um, is thinking, you know, maybe I won't want to grow tomatoes this year. I never have. I just recommend the Super Sweet 100. 100%. I absolutely agree. Perfect container plant. It Perfect mm-hmm. a- anywhere plant. And this is a cherry tomato. If you have kids, if you have little kids, they can come in, they can pluck them right off the plant and eat them. They're literally as sweet as candy. They really, really are. And um, a super sweet 100 is a variation of the sweet 100. Uh huh. And the difference between the super sweet 100 and the sweet 100 is that the super sweet has been bred to be more resistant to disease, which is really important. So that means that this is a hybrid plant. Um, we've talked before about the difference between hybrid and heirloom, and there's nothing wrong with getting a hybrid plant. It's Not still organic. It doesn't mean it has GMOs in it or anything like that. It just means that, you know, the scientist in the lab or a botanist in mm-hmm. his in his or her or their nursery have um, uh, uh, cross pollinated the plant using the Best right. qualities of certain plants. Right. They're not open pollinated in the yard. They they are already pollinated, so to speak. And that's what creates them. You cannot save... You can save the seeds, but you don't want to because they don't grow true. Such an excellent point, which I discovered that with my uh, poppies. 
my pink um, ornamental poppies. Uh huh. Um, I save the seeds on it, and the plants are orange, which is fine. The one you gave me that's yeah. actually still alive, I don't think it's pink either. It's not open yet, but I'll let you I know. I think it's going to be orange. Oh, and I love nothing, orange. That's fine. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, you can get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cherry tomatoes. Yeah, it's this. not like it gives you a hundred and then yeah. stops. It's also an indeterminate so, tomato plant. Yeah. Which means that um, it'll just produce tomatoes all year long. And it'll keep growing and producing flowers. She means all season long, unless you Thank live in you. Florida. You're welcome. And you need a lot of support, though, for a cherry tomato plant. You need you you need to stake almost all tomato plants. Let's just put that out there. That's right a good now. point, but especially a cherry. Yeah. Um, and you can those sixty days to maturity. That's really fast. Okay, good. Moving on. Um, early girl. I have early girl. This is kind of a medium size globe type tomato. And for home gardeners, um, love it because it's usually going to be one of the first tomatoes you're ever going to have ripen. Yeah, it's 50 days, I think. Oh my gosh, isn't that something? Don't forget to trim away the bottom branches six to eight inches up the plant. Mm. Now, that we haven't talked about pruning yet, but it is kind of important when they get to be a certain size. Airflow is vital. And if you have leaves on the bottom of the plant, bugs and disease can literally jump up from the soil. So you want to take that stuff off. Not just for early girl, but for all tomatoes. For plants. all tomatoes. That's yeah. right. Uh, an early girl is also a hybrid plant. It was created in the um, in the 70s um, by a variety, uh, by a guy named Joe Howland. I just want to give a shout out to Joe. This is also an indeterminate tomato plant. And it's very popular with dry gardening, dry farming. Because this is a plant that you can throw in the ground and you don't need to, it doesn't need a lot of water. You know what else is like that is the celebrity, which I did not realize. Oh. Do you have celebrity? You gave me I, celebrity last year. I'm growing celebrity also. Me too. I, I would love say them. It's, it is the um, one of the most popular tomato plants in the United States. 70 days nice. from putting in the ground to getting a tomato is about 70 days. Celebrity perfect sandwich mm -hmm. tomato. Beautiful, beautiful tomato developed after 1950. And it's a semi-determinate tomato. Explain. Well, if a determinate tomato has all the tomatoes happen all at once. Uh-huh. And, um, and an indeterminate, just they kind of grow throughout. Uh-huh. This kind of does like big blobs of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll do another blob. Oh, my gosh. You know, that's really interesting. I didn't really notice that last year. But I think you're right. Yeah. It's I hybrid, loved those celebrities. Celebrities, great. I love them. It's the best BLT. Well, one I know that you're not growing it, but I'm growing. I grew it last year. It's the Fourth of July. So I least, love Fourth of July, but I don't have any. This so year. the early girl, yeah. right? It's considered to be one of the earliest tomatoes. Uh huh. Well, the Fourth of July is the earliest ripening tomato. Um, this was bred by Burpee in the 21st century, so it's not oh, that wow. old of a variety. It's an indeterminate hybrid that can grow four to five feet tall. The tomatoes will be on the smaller side, like golf ball to maybe tennis ball. I remember. I remember. Mm -hmm. But I had a ripe tomato on July 1st. Wow. So that's how the 4th of July did for me. That's a month to six weeks earlier than a lot mm -hmm. of tomatoes. For the first time this year, I'm growing an Abe Lincoln. Oh, my goodness. Yes. From seed. It's an heirloom. That was introduced in Illinois back in 1923. Nice. Of course, in Illinois, by the Buckbee Seed Company. I love that name, Buckbee. Yeah. And it is an indeterminate, like we've been talking about. Um, and I can't wait to see what it tastes like. Oh, I'm excited. Me too. I'm also growing a Better Boy, which is a variation, an improvement of the Big Boy. The Big Boy is the first hybrid tomato ever created by Burpee in 1949. But the better boy is better than the big boy because it's more disease resistant. And um, this is a 70 to 75 day tomato. Um, a better boy, Edith, the tomato plant set a Guinness world record by producing more than 340 pounds of tomatoes oh from a single plant. Oh my gosh, jeez. Better boy. You know, that's just a giant. I don't normally grow gigantic tomatoes because they tend, sometimes the plant, you know, sure. falls. But I do grow one large one, which is my favorite, my black crim, mm. which is 80 days. So it takes a while because mm -hmm. it is really big. It was, it's an heirloom from Russia and it is the best tomato that I have ever tasted. So. And it's beautiful. 
It's black and red, black, yeah. red, purple, green. I it's love that. Gorgeous. Yeah. Well, then the last tomato we'll talk about is um, every year I always grow aroma. I do too. Mm-hmm. And aroma is, um, we'll have like an elongated egg shape type. Um, they tend to be about three inches long and they're known for their bright red, smooth and thick skin that has very few seeds. So you don't need to worry about when you're, uh, uh, if you're going to, it's great for tomato, to making tomato sauce. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. a great, they call it a good paste tomato um, because you don't have to worry about taking out the skin. Or removing the seeds. Which I don't do, by the way, ever. And I'm glad now that I did this other research, I always leave the skin and the seeds on. For everything. For everything. Yeah. And what other research is that? The one that I was talking about, how um, the nutritional value goes oh, up. Gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Even with the seeds in the skin. And how good seeds are for you. In yes. Italy, they actually sell dried tomato seeds. Did you know that? No. I didn't either. But they do for their nutritional value. Just to eat them. Yes. Just like a little poppy them. seed or something. Exactly. Well, that's amazing. Isn't that wonderful? Go buy some tomatoes, friends. Yep, absolutely. Plant and them. don't throw those seeds away. Eat them. <laughs> oh, Christy. Yeah, yes. Christy, hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello, Edith. Where are you? Christy, do you know what time it is? Um, No. It's mailbag time. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Tick tock. This week, we have a letter from Judy... S from Denver, and she has written to us about dandelions, which I think is interesting because, as you know, I have strong feelings about whether or not to pull dandelions, and you have feelings about uh-huh. whether or not to pull dandelions. And we're opposing each other. <laughs> right. So here's here's what uh, Judy is. She's kind of said it's like a little, I don't, is it a poem or a story, or how would you... Quantify it as Edith. Oh, you know, just cute little sayings. Okay, cute little sayings. It's like sayings. a dandelion talking to us. Okay, yes. And she says, wait, what? Question mark, question mark, exclamation point. This is so cool. I had no idea. Emoji, emoji, emoji. Winky, 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 winky faces. Winky, winky, winky face. Okay, here it is. Hello, I'm a dandelion. A lot of people call me a weed, but I'm a friend and come to help you. When you see me, remember that I'm the only one who wants it can grow in that particular spot because either the soil is too compact, hard, stomped, and I want to loosen it for you with my roots, or it's a little too calcium in the soil. Don't worry, I will replenish that for you with the dying of my leaves, or the soil is too acidic, and I will also improve that for you if you give me the chance, or a mixture of the above reasons, of course. I am here because your soil needs my help, so best you let me grow without disturbing me. When everything is fixed, I will disappear again, I promise. Please hold. Button. Stop. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, dandelions will disappear. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Some of this is true, probably, but some of it, and I love dandelions, is not true. If you see a dandelion maybe growing out of a crack in the sidewalk, yeah, that's the only thing that will grow there. But a dandelion in your garden, obviously, that's not the only thing that will grow there. Right. And it'll take nutrients away from your other plants. Well, maybe. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Maybe. Okay. (laughs) But it does not disappear when everything is fixed. Yeah. That's the important thing, folks. Don't think that they're not going to try to take over because they do. Okay. Unbutton. Okay. Are you trying to remove me prematurely with my root? However meticulous you are, I will return two times as strong, just until your soil is improved. You can even tell by my growth at which stage my help is at. If my leaves are flat on the ground, then I'm far from ready. But if they reach up, then I'm already a long way on my way. Something completely different is that I am one of the first bloomers in spring, so I will announce spring and summer for you. During the day when it's hot, I open my flowers. But in the evening, when it cools off, I close them again quickly. In fact, if it's not hot enough during the day, I won't open them at all. My flowers are the first food for insects after hibernation. And unlike most other plants, I have pollen and nectar, not merely one or the other, and I'm generous with them. My flowers are even delicious for you people, by the way. Did you know? I used to be called honey or gold for the poor because my flowers are so sweet in jam, sauce, or salad. The internet is full of recipes. Check them out. But wait until the end of May or later before you start picking, and even then, don't pick everything yet. The biodiversity and the bees will be very grateful. 
So, Christy, some of that is absolutely true. I eat, uh, I put leaves in my salad, dandelion yeah, sure. leaves. They're very good for you. People make dandelion wine. Absolutely. You can make a lot of things with dandelions. Yeah. So all that is true. Yeah, and I have no qualms. I have no guilt at all. I pull my dandelions with abandon because I have other things that are blooming even before dandelions come out. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's no way that in my little patch of the earth I'm not hurting the bee population at all, and I yank Well, that, that's a really good point. So if you don't have early blooming things, then I think the bees appreciate I see bees on the dandelions. Sure. Um, and I've never, you know, I've never eaten a dandelion flower. I never been doing have it as you? a kid. I think it tastes bitter. It depends on how old the plant is, I think. Oh, that's a good point. I always understood that once the flower starts to go to seed, you know, when they close yeah, up, that's yeah. when the leaves get bitter as well. Oh, interesting. But anyway, I think they're handy. I think they're a happy. I love seeing the color of them. It is the harbinger of spring for me because I don't have a forsythia. Or a grape hyacinth or tulips and daffodils come up before. In my yard, they come up before the dandelion. That's so. true, but I do not see bees at, oh, the, I do. at, the, uh, at my tulips. Yeah, I sure do. Well... Folks, do you like dandelions? What's your point of view on dandelions? Let them grow or pull them up. You should write to us. Or tell us what kind of tomatoes you're growing this year. Wouldn't that be fun, Edith, to hear different kinds of tomato varieties? Yeah, so everybody (laughs) write in. (laughs) We'll keep a log. (laughs) Oh, how should they write in, Edith? They could do upside down tulips at Gmail. They could do... um, UpsideDownTulips.com. We have an area with which they can send us messages. And now it's time for your inspiration of the week. Edith? Thank you. (laughs) This is from Rachel Carson, who wrote The Silent Spring, right? Yeah. Uh, She has been inspiring me since I first read her, read that book. And maybe she made me look at the whole world differently. And here's what she has to say. The more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. Rachel Carson. Wonderful. Isn't it? Yeah. Wonders and mysteries of the world of gardening. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah. Be part of be part of the the beauty, not the destruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, folks, you come to the end of another episode of Upside Down Tulips. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Montour Larson. Hello. Still looking for that sheet. <laughs> it's okay, Edith. I got you. Hey, friends, if you got some laughs and some value out of this week's episode, do us a favor and please hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever, wherever you, you listen, listen to, to podcasts. Your podcasts. Very good. <laughs> Thank you to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. You can listen to her, more of her music at denisegentilini.com, or you can find that link on our website. Thank you, actor friends, Billy McBride and John Ashton. And thank you to our, hey, you jumped in there. Hi, Edith. I jumped. Hello. And thank you to our excellent and enigmatic engineer. A special thanks to our local nursery and wonderful friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. And guess what? Edith is in another play. I am. So we are still doing shows bi-weekly. So join us in two weeks for another episode that will delight and amaze you. Yes, it will. Okay. Uh, uh, hello. Don't forget. <laughs> if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down to